Hello everyone and welcome to another video with me 320 Simpilot and here we have it this is the Phoenix Simulations version 2 block 2 uh, A320 aircraft for Microsoft Flight Simulator this is a huge huge update to one of the best A320s ever produced for home flight simulations and today we're taking a look at what is involved in this new version there are a huge list it is a massive list of changes and updates and fixes in this version but big highlights are going to be as you can see the IAE engines that we have on here we're going to talk about those more throughout the video we've also got upgrades to the handling of the aircraft both in flight and a lot of upgrades to the way it handles on the ground we've got some more immersion features such as the way it deals with icing and cold weather operations on the ground there's quality of life improvements to the EFB which is now on its version 2 including its snappiness responsiveness and some more features that it can have we've also got uh, other little improvements such as announcements that change throughout the cabin uh, and a core course the massive change which is the new visual model both the exterior and interior it was already one of the best looking aircraft in any simulator full stop and now it is only improved from there so I'm really excited to show you this aircraft in the, the video today we're going to be using the IAE version which is the engine you can see here which is the alternative to the CFM engine which is what we previously had with the Phoenix um, and we're going to take it for a flight from uh, a rather chilly and cold and wintry Alessand in Norway up to uh, Molde in Norway just to, to show you some of those cold weather operations. I'm a real world airline pilot. I have thousands of hours flying on the A320 family. I flew it for almost a decade. It is an absolutely fantastic aeroplane and I really, really uh, love flying it and it's great to see it represented here in the simulator. I don't fly it at the moment. I'm currently operating the Boeing 787 in real life. But even so, hopefully in today's video, I can bring you some extra context to your home simulations and give you a bit of a comparison about the real aircraft and how we would operate it in the real world. As ever, this is not for any real world use, but just to give you some of that extra context on your home simulations. I also must say that I was previously uh, involved in the beta for the original Phoenix Simulations A320, although I did not have involvement in this uh, aircraft, well, the Block 2 version of this aircraft, um, as I was just too busy to be a part of it. So, uh, yeah, this is just my thoughts on the release version, uh, and that's all you uh, will get from me today. Now we must start this video with the exterior model which is on its version 2 now, so version 2 of the artwork. As I said, it was already super, really one of the best out there and now it is just in another level again. It looks absolutely stunning from any angle and as you would expect with the Phoenix simulations, you can get as close as you like and it just looks better and better and better. The liveries are now updated to version 2 so the old liveries will not work with this new model. That's because they've changed some of the 3D modeling as well. Look at the lights, here we go. So you've got the two different nav systems there, so those are the green uh, nav lights but there's two separate bulbs and then you've got your anti-collision strobe light here. Um, sitting next to it absolutely amazing it just looks so good the static wicks here uh, on the on the um, wingtip fence so yes this is uh, all new and it just looks endlessly gorgeous I, I can't find an angle I don't like look at the uh, bits of oil and grease on the top of the speed brakes there the different texturing between the wing surface and the the paint used for the guidelines of the walking area uh, it's interesting uh, that I always find it funny that the A320 CEO family had different textures. Some had sort of a matte wing and some had a sort of glossy wing. Here we get that sort of matte uh, over, over wing look and then a bit of a glossy on the spoilers. But yeah, unbelievable. And you can zoom right into bits that I've never seen. <laughs> I've never seen this part of the airplane. But look at that. Presumably some lighting for the exits, I'm imagining. Yeah, really, really amazing. You've got the paint flaking away from the screws and you can see inside the full cabin in there. Lots more to come on that cabin, including the way it lights up and now has announcements. But yeah, very, very nice. And the way the paint just flakes away over these rivet heads. Absolutely brilliant. These liveries are updated and included. This livery was in the Phoenix installer, which does seem to recognize when you've up updated to the, the Block 2 uh, version. Moving around, the rest of it, just ridiculously good. I, I could talk about it all day, just wandering around the A320, but it's so hard to pick up on anything amiss anymore. It's really quite amazing. This outflow valve closed at the moment. The airplane is depowered in the current state. All the labels closed open, stickers sort of sitting there. They do eventually flake away. Um, you can see we have the ice detectors fitted to this aircraft. Um, yeah, absolutely lovely. No bad angles just a nice level of wear and tear as well you can uh, 
people have different preferences i like some wear on my airplanes and simulators as i've mentioned before uh, i think it it's definitely a more likely way to see an airplane very rare to see them new here's more of those uh <laughs> the paint flaking off those rivets absolutely brilliant but the star attraction and the big thing we're seeing added into this aircraft now is the IAE engines, which we were waiting for. Everyone was very excited to see them, and here they are. Uh, previously, only the CFM engine, a very popular engine, but this is the alternative, the IAE. It's a smaller sort of fan diameter than the CFM engine, and it's the competitor to the CFM. So this was how the HV-20 was sold for a long time. You had a choice between the CFM engine, a CFM-56, and the IAE V2500, which is what we have here. Uh, this is a very popular engine as well. They both did very, very well. In terms of performance, not much between them. I, I In terms of operating them, there's there's not much difference. The Neos are noticeably more powerful, but these, uh, or feel more powerful certainly, but these ones are, uh, the CFM, i.e. are relatively similar in terms of performance. But uh, we have different manufacturers. So this is IAE. And let me just bring up my uh, ever useful notes. IAE is uh, a name for International Aero Engines. There we go. Uh, so this was a, a group of manufacturers who came together to produce this engine for Airbus uh, for the A320, CFM being the producer of the other one. So this, the manufacturers who made the IAE engine uh, included Rolls-Royce and it also included Pratt & Whitney. As a result of it being a Rolls-Royce, we have um, this pressure gauge and it runs on EPR, engine pressure ratio, which is something we'll see in the flight deck. Now I've got a bit of wind blowing through the engine and it's just gently rotating this front fan, the N1 fan, and it just smoothly animated so well. And we're going to see that during startup as well. Really quite amazing. But look at the texturing right up. Again, you can get as close as you like. They've just absolutely nailed the visuals on this model. It's gorgeous and the intake as well this intake lining often had uh you know it does get, get quite a sort of mottled effect lots of repairs often done to it this lining is incredibly important you might think well you know as long as the engine's running we can have bits of damage and so on here but no actually this lining is, is incredibly well looked after and is incredibly tight on its tolerance of what's acceptable the reason is there's a huge uh, draw through the engine and the engine is obviously sucking in air and any defects in this lining and uh, the potential is for the engine to try and draw it through the engine so it's very carefully uh, maintained but yeah it's still it can end up looking in that sort of strange uh, more worn texture but that's only a function of it being so well uh, polished and maintained and looked after the modeling all around is super now i wish i could remember all the different parts of this engine on the outside and what they actually do that there's lots of vents and accessory gearboxes and so on around the edge uh, and oil drains down here and this is an oil drain mask at the bottom as well or different there's different fluids um, but you don't typically uh, want to see much dripping out of an engine on the ground this is uh, the um reverse lockout pin up there which would be sticking out if you can't use the reverse as just a small little marker i love the oil and grime this is the thrust reverser door you can see it here just just lovely absolutely lovely i do like this blinding pink livery i think it's very nice all looking super really really nice as we move around to the tail of this or the, the tail cone of this engine let's just have a look through the back see how they've modeled it ah no that is interesting if the front fan is spinning, this should also be spinning. This is the rear turbine, but perhaps it's not a, a model effect at the moment. But there we go. That is connected directly to the N1 fan at the front. But yeah, this is the back of the engine. That's exactly what it looks like. They've got the modeling and the shaving just super spot on, as you'd expect. It's quite a small core of the engine, but compared to a Neo, it's relatively large ratio now. The Neos are a much larger fan compared to that. As you come around to the other side, oh, you've got this little vent at the bottom. Sometimes there's a little spring in there, but uh, not always. So that's pretty pretty good and accurate to see. And over here we have the oil and hydraulic, uh, sorry, not hydraulic, just the oil uh, and other servicing that the engineers can do. These panels are uh, used pretty much every time the aircraft's inspected by engineers. So they often get grimy because, the, of course, they're used a lot. So, yeah, brilliant, brilliant texturing, brilliant modeling. We've got the nacelle strake modeled up there as well. And these little dots, now what these are exactly, I don't know. But yeah, they are there on the real airplane. Seen them many, many times. It's just great. They captured it perfectly. The shape, the textures, the size. Nice to see this included. There's a, a free update. It's really, really, really pleasant. Um, yeah, this matte sort of finish as well is completely accurate. You have a matte in the cell. It's not chrome like you have on some 737s. It is this sort of matte. And look at that. You can see the ripple in the uh, the metal, in, metal around the rivets. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. It just gets better and better. That's just as the light casts across it. 
These screws up here, by the way, are an uh, important part of the Airbus, um, and it's quite important that they aren't missing in certain places. Some are allowed to be missing, so don't panic if you don't see one there, but they are um, uh, variously monitored as to which ones need to be fitted and not, so typically the ones on the leading edge of these panels, but they are prone to coming away because, of course, they're right next to the engine. So, yeah. That's, uh, that's always fun for engineers to have to get a step ladder up there and start finding little screws and putting them back in. Brilliant. Just brilliant. As with the whole aeroplane, it's just so good to look at. Moving along the wing, I mean, I, I really didn't have many problems with the old model, but this is just taking it to a whole new level. Fantastic. All around. It just speaks for itself. I, I don't even know if there's anything I need to say. <laughs> we had the best, and it's it's just ridiculous now ridiculous now what we're going to do is also take a look at the interior artwork as we go into the flight deck i can't quite bring myself to go inside yet i'm just still enjoying this exterior model as you move around you can actually see the the way the light bounces off streaks on the tail up here and of course we know that the phoenix already had fantastic uh, detailing in the, the sunshine with the sort of streaks of oil and the old de-icing fluid over the fuselage and you can still see that here little bits of grime from the windows it always surprises me how airliners get black streaks below the windows considering they fly forward through the air but it always seems to run down i assume it's just pollution and, and air pollution when sat at airports on the ground for a while and then it doesn't get washed away in flight Moving around the tail, this is quite a common sight um, to see sort of bits of grease around the, the tail area of the aeroplane where it collects and doesn't really get washed away. Often after you've de-iced, you'll see de-icing fluid back here. It's really getting silly because it, it looks like a photograph at this point, even as I'm moving the camera around. Uh, you could just screenshot any of this and it would just it'd be a struggle to tell. Um, and that was certainly the case when I was looking at the pictures provided for the, the uh, release announcement. Very hard to, to distinguish what was real and what was in the simulator. And it's been a while since it's uh, it's been possible to say that. This trim indicator should be at zero during your walk around. It means that the airplane was, uh, after landing, had a normal normal sort of taxi in and the, the stabilizer, stabilizer was reset to zero automatically by the flight control computers. Um, in the uh, Boeing aircraft, that doesn't happen. It sits at the last landing trim. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. All of it. Endlessly, endlessly accurate so real it just looks like an operational airplane same as well of course as we look around the wheels uh, we've got the chocks fitted here but as we move in we don't have the brake fans on this which you can see but we could of course activate them in the efb and then you can see the grime and wear some interesting features now with the brake wear and the cooling have been modeled very accurately so uh, depending on the, the displacement of the disc and how much there is they'll cool differently and also whether they're in the airflow or not really quite amazing stuff This is always a grimy part of the airplane, of course. Near the wheels, lots of grease around these parts. A lot of moving parts here, big moving parts that need to have grease. And then you've also got grease along the slats. So you'd often get streaks of what look quite red and almost like bird strikes, but it's actually grease coming off the, the main gear and onto the flaps here. Sometimes you see it on the tailplane, but that's relatively rare. So here we are on the fly deck, and I've skipped ahead a little bit. Uh, I've set the airplane up. But let's take a look around at this new artwork. It is just, as as with exterior, absolutely fantastic. Every part of it just looks glorious. Look at the texturing on the seats here, the, the way the material looks. It looks spot on to how the real aircraft is. Quite a coarse material, but very hard-wearing. They're very nice seats, actually. I do like the A320 seats a lot. Uh, as you'd expect as well, you can click, including the jump seat squeak, which is very, very nice. Uh, and Of course, this is the... Phoenix, so you can pull the circuit breakers and they respond accordingly. Just brilliant, all very, very nice. I already thought the texturing and the modeling in the flight deck was, was super and now it's just even better as you would expect, just not a single bad angle on it. They've also improved the integral lighting, which is the, the lighting behind and also I believe the lighting in general. Like I say, no bad angle. Looks absolutely glorious and spot on to the real aircraft from wherever you look at it. Uh, it. It was already up there as the best, pretty much. And look at this. And the amount of stuff that works, uh, it's, it's quite ridiculous, really. Uh, and as you can see, the cabin still here, still looking absolutely fantastic. And you can have it modified according to your, your airline's tastes. The cabin announcements also play at different volumes at different parts of the cabin, which is really just <laughs> a, a absolutely ludicrous level of detail. It looks great. Really, really like it. Let's jump back into the seat, though, because we'll see more of that throughout uh, 
our sim adventures in the Phoenix A320 and let's have a look at the uh, changes in the flight deck that we're going to notice when operating the airplane. So uh, one thing is over here we have the new EFB. This is on version 2 now. It's more responsive as you can see. You can see, click through things and it, it does pop to them straight away uh, and they are, yeah, it's, it's really nice. It was already, I'd say, one of the best EFBs out there, but now it's just that bit more responsive and that, that really does make a difference when using it. I, I like it a lot. Also, the apps are persistent, so when you go between them, it does stay with whatever you had there before, which is really, really nice. As you can see, of course, it still loads in from SimBrief as mine is, so we're going to do a little flight, although actually we'll probably just return to Allison. I, I think we'll just save time that way. Uh, and we can also have this engine fan heating, which is a, a new feature added in here. Um, in a very cold conditions, not quite like what we have here, but in cold conditions that where it's uh, almost at freezing temperatures or below freezing temperatures and you have precipitation and high humidity, so freezing fog would be a classic example, you can get a build-up of ice on the fan blades on the ground. Um, it's quite an amazing thing to see. It just builds up potentially on the front or on the leading edge of them, but either way, you're not allowed to have ice on these engines as you start them up. It's very heavy and it can build up on a whole sheet of covering the whole entire blade, front, back and from leading edge. And obviously that would just break off into the engine during start or potentially be too heavy to allow this fan to start turning properly during the start process. Anyway, the result is you would have to use hot air to de-ice it, which is literally like a hairdryer where they come and blast hot air and just melt it off. Now, I have seen this in real life, and there is an awkward reality to it, which is that, of course, uh, as soon as you restart the engines, that ice builds up straight away. But the point is the engine's running then, so it's able to shed it in its own way, uh, which we'll talk about later on, because that's something else that Phoenix have now added into the modeling. But yeah, so that is now here, engine fan heating if you need it, which we don't today, because it's not likely to build up, even though it's very cold out there. It's, we're in minus five degrees, I think, with some snow on the ground. Uh, the humidity and the clear skies would suggest that you, you shouldn't really expect it to build up now. Uh, it looks like a relatively dry day now. Something else added into the EFB, if you go to, no, wrong one, uh, your little documents app, you can now find uh, a checklist, the user guide, and here we have the full QRH, which has been added. They do provide the link to find this as a PDF, and I would probably still recommend using that. Uh, this is a little bit of a difficult way of reading it, but it is now built in here. Very nice indeed. Um, as ever, the Navigraph charts can be loaded in and we are sat here on the apron. Looking pretty good. We're going to go and taxi out, take off from runway 06 here at Addison just to experience sort of the the wintry conditions and show you some of these these new updates. Now, down on the MCDU, you'll see that it is more responsive. They've improved the delay. So as you type, it, it really nice. It actually brings up the letters immediately which is is really nice it wasn't terrible before but this is a really responsive airplane now to use so it just feels really nice i i, I think this is a nice improvement it's worth noting that uh, some of the real aircraft actually do struggle with the delay of um selecting things like this uh, it's not uncommon on an a320 especially when it's cold and warming up still to type something in like this and it just sits there blank for a few seconds and then suddenly it all appears i've had that many many times but yeah this is now a, a nice warmed up and relatively modern <laughs> uh, mcdu which I, I like a lot i've already loaded in the performance and the rest of the mcdu of course your sim brief username goes into here and allows you to load in the routes so that's what i've already done and we've also loaded in the performance, of course, so we are pretty much ready to go. I'm going to see if we can hear some cabin announcements. They should be louder with the door open and then more muffled with it closed. So let's see um, if there is a... They should be automatic, so let's see how we can get that going. So APU is on. We're going to get APU bleed on. Get rid of the ground power. And let's go and get rid of the ground stuff. Just before we do that, a couple of extra features in here now. We have cabin announcements, as I said, enabled on mute on task switch. So I'm going to leave that on for now. Uh, airline modifiable. I've got AC essential switching as usual, but something that's um, had it in dual advisory eye detection. I'm not going to have that. EFB mount is on frame. The the other one was the window mount, which is the one way of having it that Phoenix had before. But now I would definitely choose frame. I prefer it. The window mount is suction cupped onto the window, and if, you know it can come off. It can get loose. It's a bit of a pain. Whereas the frame version is just fitted straight into the frame of the airplane. Presumably more expensive to fit. Uh, and therefore maybe less popular but there we go i like it as a pilot anyway but pilots always like things that are more expensive that seems to be the way it goes so how airlines feel about it i imagine 
Um, in here, I've got the EFIS Barrow linked. I want those the same and rudder dampening on for now. And there was one more thing, which was the DCDU, which is down here. If you turn on DCDU, it brings you this little window here. This is used for CPDLC, so when you're typing to air traffic control, not talking to them on the radio. I'm going to leave that off for now. And the cabin ready feature over here, hopefully we'll see that during the taxi out. Whoops. Another advantage, by the way, of having the frame mounted uh, EFB holder is that you can use the sunshade properly. The trick is I need to close it. There we go. Um, yeah, so cabin ready comes up on the eCam during the taxi out to say that the cabin is ready. It saves you having to call the cabin or look on a camera or whatever other system you have. Uh, this is the simplest way. It just appears in part of the eCam to say you're, you're ready to go, which I really like. Love the modeling here. Even the flap and the uh, pressure relief all closed properly. Just glorious glorious stuff now let's talk about these iae engines i want to start one of them on stand just so we can get a good look at those animations you can see that they've really got the the spin of this really nicely sort of ticking over i'm going to show you the startup animation with the sounds as well so you can you can experience what they've done i think it's some of the smoothest fan blade changing in speed that i've ever seen in a simulator really really nice so let's just make sure we run through our checklists uh, like i say this is not a tutorial this is just me showing you as simply as I can some of the changes but we've done copy prep we've set the barrow we've done the a cars parking brake is on we've got our 3.6 tons on board of fuel and it bees loaded flex temp we're going with uh, 59 takeoff speeds we have 134 135 139 passenger signs are on and auto beacon can go on just check our thrust levers are idle and we'll put the transponder to auto good stuff Staff, all doors are closed. Now the slides arm. I want to see if we can hear the PA. I'm going to turn up the sounds for you so you can enjoy um, hearing this engine start. I'm going to leave the door open as well, see if it helps us hear any of the PAs. Maybe we need to push back for that to work properly. I don't know. Anyway, we're going to start one engine on stand. So let's do that. We're going to start up, I'm going to show you this, the number one engine. So ignition start, sorry, the number two engine right engine as a Boeing would call it got the pressure at the start valve turn it on takes longer to start than a CFM engine the IAE but there we go that's now putting pressure through spinning the N2 let's have a look So a slight bug there, as you can see, with the the uh, the color of the spinner. But other than that, one of the smoothest startups I've ever seen in the simulator. I also like what uh, Phoenix have done with the heat blower at the back. I think they've found a really nice balance because the Microsoft Flight Simulator heat blower I find a little bit wishy-washy, but they've got a really nice one running here. I think it looks absolutely great. One of the best heat blowers in Microsoft Flight Simulator. But yeah, I think that engine startup is fantastic. The sounds are glorious and the, the smoothness. It's the same for the shutdown I have checked. The way it transitions is absolutely brilliant. Oh, just look at it. It's absolutely fantastic. It looks just like the real thing. Amazing. Now, at this point, I feel I should be clear. I, I've not been paid to make this video, and I wasn't paid or, uh, in the uh, uh, to be on the beat or anything for the original uh, Phoenix release. So, yeah, this is all just my own genuine thoughts and opinions on this aircraft. Right, let's get pushed back, see if we can get some of those announcements to play. Just turn on the audio again for you a little bit. And uh, yeah, we'll see uh, some other features during the taxi out. Quite a lot of change during the taxi of this airplane. So do do stay tuned. <laughs> Not something I normally say. Let's just get a straight pushback going. So we go back to our app and we'll start the pushback, please. Here comes the tug. All the systems just work so well. Look at that nose was doing disconnecting amber because they disconnected that. 
Target's connecting. They would of course call you when they're ready to go. I'm going to assume they've done that and released the parking brake. Okay, that was an error. <laughs> they were not ready to go. <laughs> Let's have a look at what's going on. There we go. Right, now we can release it. Just do a straight push back and then a right turn to get out and do a backtrack down the runway. They've modified lighting and all sorts. Let's just have a quick look if we make it a bit gloomy. See the cabin is lit up. keep it nice and bright for today right let's start up engine number one so before we do that they've added in some start faults which i quite like so actually no we won't do it on there we'll do it on here so we can go to failures so let's have a failure of a start fault so assuming the left engine and what i'm going to do is give it a uh let's give it a no ignition on the left engine and just see what happens immediate okay oh no let's put it back to immediate there we go right so we're going to start number one by moving that forward pressure goes in and two accelerates start the chrono oh there we go so as i was saying earlier the cfm engines take something around i think it's about 35 45 seconds to start up iae engines take longer than that over a minute to a minute and a half they sort of motor for longer at this stage before introducing fuel which is quite normal um, so yeah cfm pilots do prefer the the quick start on those most typically but there we go so it's motoring away fuel has been introduced it's using ignition system b but we're not getting a light up you can see that we're not getting an egt rise the airplane should recognize this we don't need to do anything the fadec full authority digital engine control is now doing its magic it's going to realize this on the real airplane it will do this there you go start fault ignition fault auto crank in progress you don't do anything it's not telling us to do anything what it's doing now is pumping air through that engine so if we move over to uh, engine number one which is over here you can see it's still turning because air is being pumped through as the airplane attempts to dry out the fuel that's been introduced because it was pouring fuel in but it didn't ignite so now it's going to keep pumping air through to dry that out again and now it's telling us engine master one off saying you're done it hasn't worked off and there we go so one way around this now is um and not to say this is how you do this in the real airplane we're only on one engine so that's why we have those warnings is you could do a manual start to force it to use both ignition systems what we could assume has happened here is that ignition system b didn't work so we want to use ignition system a it's worth noting though of course that the real aircraft would also at this point swap over if i now restart the engine it would use so let's clear the fault uh, it would now use ignition system a so you could put it back to ignition and start again uh, again this is not this is not me being uh, official this is just showing you some of the, the quirks of the airbus if you do a manual engine start it gives you both ignition systems so if you're flying an airplane with a fault on one of the ignition systems you'll actually be instructed as part of the MEL procedures to do manual engine starts to give you A and B. Manual engine starts are done with this up here um, although this is not the official technique for doing it but there you go you can just just to show you that A and B ignition system are being used uh, which lights it up. So nice to see these faults are now uh, modeled in here. Just gonna wait for the engine to stabilize it's all lit up. We have our fuel flow on EGT. I'm going to put that back. I can't remember the order you do that, but there we go. <laughs> um, and the engine is started and stabilized and available. Excellent. Let's run through our normal after start flow then. Now we're in an IAE aircraft. Have a look at this. We have EPR, engine pressure ratio. Uh, this is what Rolls Royce love to use. Uh, and that's because Rolls Royce were heavily involved in the development or one of the manufacturers of the, or part of the team that made this engine. It's used because it's, in theory, a more accurate result or a more accurate description of what the engine is giving you. It's giving you the difference in pressure between the intake and the exhaust of the engine. So you can actually get a reading of what thrust that engine is giving you. An N1 reading is just the spinning of the front fan. So the argument for N1 would be, well, it's a bit like if you know what gear you're in in your car and you know the RPM of the engine, then in theory, you know how fast you're driving. So with M1, we know how much thrust we're getting because it's spinning at 22.1%. And if I increase the power, M1 increases, 
so I must be getting more power uh, all the way up to whatever 100% N1 but there is obviously a, a flip side to that which is that N1 can be degraded if there's ice on the fan blades like we talked about earlier maybe you're not getting the right amount of thrust from them if there's uh, stalls in the engine or other issues maybe you're not maybe there's damage inside of it uh, maybe um, it's just a, a misreading uh, N1 uh, sensor so yeah it's N1 is the normal way to control a jet engine in a lot of uh, aircraft but if Rolls-Royce are involved it's not uncommon or it's typical of Rolls-Royce to use EPR or something similar on the 787 they use TPR turbo fan power ratio um, which has a few more variable set things sensed in it it's very accurate very clever uh, and something that is I never use <laughs> um, and this is what I'm going to show you why this number is incredibly sensitive 1.0305 look how fast it changes like I say very accurate amazing but not all that useful for me as a pilot I find it much easier to use these N1s so if I think I need to fly an approach then I might use a datum of around about 55% on the N1s that sort of thing uh, I won't remember the EPR number the EPR number will also change depending on you know as you're in the descent it can actually go below one because you've got pressure on the front of the engine as it causes a bit of drag things like that so yeah EPR is that's what it is that's why it's there you've got those extra gauges now with the IAE engines but M1 is still typically a reference now if you have trouble because EPR uses more sensors we looked at it earlier we have this uh, little sensor here on the intake uh, measuring the pressure so what if a bird hits that and takes out that sensor or a, a bee decides to, to set up camp inside that sen the sensor well that could send our EPR haywire what you can do then on these engines is these N1 mode buttons which you don't have on CFM aircraft because they're already in N1 and what that does is it drives the engine into an N1 mode where it's using that as the reference point I talked earlier about the cabin ready option in the EFB so here you go cabin check and there you go automatically gone to cabin ready oh I think they're calling us I'll close that door <laughs> there you go cabin is ready um, good stuff I'm just gonna do the auto brakes to uh, no we'll do it later as we taxi actually so let's taxi out to the runway put on the nose lights taxi runway turn off lights we don't actually need the APU and we will have the engine anti-ice due to the conditions out there so they've modified the handling of the airplane so brakes released Rolling away, we're pretty light. And we'll make the right turn round. Now the Phoenix handled nicely, I thought originally, but what they've done is adjust the braking in particular. So, as we stand on the brakes, at slow speed they're quite responsive, but if we get a bit of speed going, they're really quite smooth it's nice it's a nice feeling it's something to get used to but it is it's, it's easy to control I like the way they've handled the toe brakes now I am using rudder pedals with toe brakes something else to note is you'll see the way they, the rudder is smoothed and dampened so even if I move from full left to full right it does respond but it's not quite as instant as I'm doing it I think that helps with Microsoft's sort of grippy over responsive ground handling so there we go now we're about to line up on the runway I'm just going to put the strobe light on Something else to note is that with the dampening, it can end up lagging behind you. Here we go, I'm sort of oscillating a little bit. So that's something to be careful of. Now, in the real aircraft, we do the flight control checks as we taxi. On the Boeing, we do it before we taxi. But in the 320, we do it as we taxi. So you can, as ever, move your side stick around and you'll see that the flight control page accurately pops up, which is correct. And if you're in the cabin, you would now see all the controls moving, which I'm sure many of you have seen as passengers on A320 aircraft but the rudder is also done during these flight control checks and that's a bit awkward because of course uh, how do we do that without getting the airplane to steer well they've now modeled that this pedal disconnect button is what we would do when we want to move the rudder pedals without moving the nose or steering we press that and then we can move the rudder pedals to check that the rudder moves uh, and whilst still taxing the airplane in a straight line so now what I it would Phoenix have come up with a bit of a way around this which is you can click on this pedal adjustment lever which is how you would move these pedals forward and backwards in the real aeroplane so I click on that and now as I move my rudder it actually just moves the steering tiller so we're not moving the oh, the rudder 
So now my rudders have become the tiller axis. If I want to move the rudder only, I'm going to press it again and press the pedal disconnect. And there we go. Now I'm just moving the rudder. A little bit awkward as we head off the <laughs> side of the runway. So there's a way around it now, which is that you can have a more realistic way of taxiing, which is click on that. And now this is how you would expect the airplane to be just steering using the tiller. You do use the rudder pedals for straight line steering when you're doing sort of the higher speeds. You know, if you're going in a straight line, 15, 20 knots, then it's more typical just to use the rudder pedals because that way you get a slightly less input on the nose wheel. Um, but anyway, there we go. And then, like I say, you can disconnect now and uh, get yourself. Oh. If I get it the right way around, there we go. Get yourself a flight control check done properly, which is good fun. I like that. If a little bit. Uh, hard to remember what you're trying to or what you've actually got set up but there we go it's a neat feature i haven't seen before right let's get the airplane lined up and we'll talk about the next thing which is icing on those fan blades a very big issue for aircraft in cold weather so welcome to the same position but now we have a rather more wintry uh <laughs> setup um I want to show you the fan blade icing that's now modeled really quite a cool feature so in these conditions where we are just below zero we're in low visibility so high humidity uh, we can often get or we can get fan blade icing I say often it's actually quite rare for a noticeable amount to build up during the taxi out or flying the airplane fan blade icing is dangerous it can it can degrade the performance of the engine and also cause a lot of vibration so uh, what I've done is I've got the engine anti-ice off and we're just sitting here now that only heats up the intake but uh, regardless you can see our vibration on this number two engine going up and down um, and what it does is, as we saw earlier, or I talked about earlier, it's just that ice building up on the front of the fan blade. As we apply power, we would normally expect to see that vibration increase, and there it is. Look at that. Now, I would expect it to affect both engines. Certainly, the time I saw it, it did. But anyway, here we go. So, vibration's increasing, and the engine's not able to deliver the EPR I'm asking for. The number one engine clearly is not as affected. No vibration, and it is delivering what I ask for. The number two is struggling. As I increase the power, uh, it does more so. Now, the way to actually get rid of fan blade icing is a bit unusual, and it's not very well um, understood by pilots until they've had to deal with it because it's something that's so rare. Um, but what it is is the ice builds up on the fan blade, so you rev the engines usually to about 50%, although we're not going to manage that here, um, and the engine will vibrate a lot yet yeah, three and I think at the time I saw this it vibrated up in I think it was around the five it got really really vibration it felt like you're driving a turbo prop along it's actually 60 percent is a bit high and then what you do is you bring them up to that high power setting obviously stopped safe so you don't get dragged around the taxiway or anything and then idle the engines again and as you change the speed of the engine that actually sheds the ice now that's modeled slightly differently here at the moment in the phoenix because as you can see i've idled it but the vibration remains and i still can't actually get the engines up to full power if i try i'm just going to rev, rev up engine number two okay. and you can hear it there doing engine stalls which is that banging it's incredibly loud that banging in the real aircraft but yeah that is um, not going to deliver the power I want. You can see here, it's just not going to do it. Uh, it's just stalling over and over. So we'll bring them back to idle. Like I say, in the real aircraft, the icing should now shed. You should be able to rev it up, it would vibrate and then shed. But if you had enough, I suppose it's possible to disrupt the air in the engine enough to give you engine stalls. Anyway, what I'm going to do is turn on the engine anti-icing to clear that. But like I say, in the real aircraft, you would clear it by revving an engine and decelerating it. And only then does it disappear. It's quite a strange feeling because you have to rev the engine. You, you, you have the high vibration. But then as you idle them, it's still you still think you have the vibration. You have no evidence that it's gone until you next rev the engines and you see that they're no longer vibrating. Anyway, there we go. So let's just improve that weather slightly because we are in a beautiful part of the world and I don't want to be flying around in this misery. Now they've changed the rotation technique or the rotation feel, so I'm going to give that a go now. Let's get ready for takeoff. So parking brake released. We'll go to... About 50%. Brakes released. Half side stick. Two clicks forwards. There's Manflex 59 SRS. Or thrust is armed and blue. Now with this rudder damped, let's see how that feels. Yeah, that's nice. That removes some of that ag aggressive grip that we get with the uh, Microsoft's uh, handling. As we approach 100 knots, we go to stick to neutral. 
Oof, it's breezy out there, taking a lot of rudder. It's a serious crosswind I've said set up, so this is quite challenging conditions. <laughs> I might fiddle with that rudder sensitivity. And there's V1, rotates. Positive climb, gear up, pitch into the SRS. Well, the rotation felt lovely, no complaints there. I think I'm just going to change that damping. I'm not. Maybe I'll remove the damping, um, but I will. I will experiment more as we continue to uh, operate the aircraft. Noises are absolutely glorious. I hope you are enjoying those. They sound really, really fantastic to me. Gonna put an oars pilot in. Bring the thrust levers back to climb. And now let the airplane accelerate. Now I'm sure by now you're starting to get a sense of <laughs> what a mission it is to actually talk about this many things on uh, or this many this big of an update to this fantastic aircraft. There's so much going on. Handling and landing have also been changed and tweaked, uh, including the flare. That's something I'm going to have to see as we take the airplane on more flights and do more different landings and uh, approaches with it and just experiment with it as we, as we fly it on the channel. So with the airplane in the air now, let's just get a sense of how it feels and how it flies. First of all, I think it's lovely. They have changed the recommended sensitivity settings, but yeah, it is, uh, which is available in the blog post and the release notes, but yeah, it, it feels absolutely beautiful as I would hope for an A320. Uh, I thought it was not bad before but this is, is still another step up on that. They've also improved the alpha protection the way the airplane handles when you effectively forget about it <laughs> which is not a good thing to happen but if you leave the engines at idle raise the nose you'll see it reach alpha protection here and then the airplane will now lower the nose to try and maintain a safe uh, angle of attack. So here it goes dropping that nose trying to keep us there and if I pull back I can actually push through that until it gets to the red bar alpha max but there we go alpha floor now activating so i'm going to lower the nose and recover get a bit of power on we don't want to drive up too much power until we get some authority but there we go so yeah it feels really nice the way it rolls the weight of it very nice indeed they have modified the wing flex a little bit as well and hopefully as you can hear the sounds are just fantastic let's get that real buzzsaw sound of the IAE engines in. Really nice. As those are the new engines, we wanted to hear how, how good they could sound, and I think they just sound amazing. Look at the visuals in this flight deck. Absolutely brilliant. There are also changes to the way the airplane lands, uh, which is something that we'll have to see as we fly it more and more on the channel. I can't comment just in one video on a landing. I want to see this airplane in, in different scenarios as we as we use it on our live stream. So do please subscribe if you'd like to see more of that. Um, we also have got some changes to look at, including the cost indexes and the VNAV calculations have all been improved over the previous version. So some pretty nice changes there to come. Again, things that we'll see as we use this airplane more operationally on the live streams on the channel in the future. Lovely. Feels absolutely great. So that's all for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it and as I say loads more to come. It's a really impressive update to what was already a fantastic airplane. The artwork and the sounds have just reached a whole new level. The system's depth is as brilliant as ever and now we have the fantastic engine modeling and these new IAE engines to enjoy. So really nothing to complain about at all in this new update. Do please subscribe if you'd like more uh, of this sort of content as well as some live streams where we'll fly this aircraft and I can chat and answer your questions live on the channel. That's all from me then. Thank you so much for watching. Please do keep safe and well. We'll see you again in another video or live stream soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.